how do we create a culture amongst our team? You know, it's one thing to be dealing with the episodes that are, you know, popping up once in a while here and dealing with that. But, you know, in this day and age, what what could I do? I have 30 people, 50 people that are working for me, and I can't interact with each and every one of them. I can't have each of them coming into the office and sitting on my couch or whatever. What what would you say in terms of guidance to create a culture of support and where it's okay not to be okay? But then the flip side is, let's be honest, we can't have, honestly, the pragmatic part is we can't have everybody off any time that they feel have feelings of stress, you know, like they're there. And I, I'm not, and I'm not saying that from a negative way, but I mean, just from a practical perspective, I think a lot of leaders are grappling with that too. It's like, Oh man, what, like, I'm going to lose my whole team. So culturally, yeah. Jeff, what, what kind of guidance could you give? Well, you know, uh, Daryl, I think you and I were, uh, on a, on a video, um, exchange between leaders a while ago. And I heard something that I absolutely love. You're not going to change climate until you change Sorry, you're not going to change the culture until you focus on changing the climate. And I absolutely love that because we keep talking about this, this hot buzzword is change the culture, change the culture. Um, I actually don't believe that we can directly change culture. I love what that leader said, and you know who I'm talking about, that said you need to change the climate before the culture will change. And so just think about it. If we changed one half a degree every day or every week within the sphere of influence that we have, how dramatic that would be. And you think about just those acts of, of empathy, those acts of, of recognition, those acts of just connecting. Um, you know, I, I used to work at an office where I, I would walk down the hall and I would say good morning to everybody. And it was just part of my habit. I love doing that. And the last office on the right, um, I would never get a reply back from. And so probably after about six months, I just thought that I was bothering that person. So I just walked by. And probably about two weeks later, my you know, office door opens and, and in walks this person saying, well, what have I done that you stopped saying good morning to me? And I'm like, I thought it was bothering you. I thought I never got a reply out of your dark, your dark office. So I thought it was just an intrusion. And um, she said that was the, the, the thing she looked forward to every day. The other thing I'm going to tell you, just something really funny, is that um, my my secretary, um, she used to. I would open this cupboard every morning to sort of get the stuff out that I needed, and every day she would ta- she would she would tape a happy bunny uh, calendar meme in there, and it would make me laugh. And you you those are the little things that start to change the climate, that start to influence the culture, which is just a recognition that we all need something. We all need something. Find what people need. They'll find what you need. And that's when you start to ch- train, change the, the climate. Um, but I think that it's just recognizing that you're, you're dealing with the humans. And um, you're a human. And as a leader, how can you not relate to what others need and, and, and also what you need as a leader? And I think that just get back down to that human level of relating to people as people is really what starts to change the culture. Get to know them, get to know what they need, get to know what they like. They'll probably get to know what you need and what you not like as well. And I think that when you start to sort of say leaders are worried about the absenteeism, What I would say is ignoring it is actually going to increase the absenteeism. We have a huge deficit in certain uh, fields right now where people are, um, in some industries, and I won't name them, 40% of the people are off on either a WCB or a, a disability claim. And if you ask those people why they're off, because of how management and supervisors are treating them, if they just let us do our job, if they just support it, if they just give us a bathroom break, if they just if they just recognize that we're going through a stressful time, um, we'd be at work. But it is the climate that is actually causing people to go off more so than anything else. So you look after the climate, and we talk about climate change all the time with regards to our environment. How is this really any different? Our workplace and where we lead is is our environment. Well, guess what? make sure that the temperature is set right for the people that are there. And you as a leader have the ability to set that temperature. And the responsibility. And just yeah. so we're clear, it's Pete Van Dorp, okay, and his ego is going to go massive. <laughs> Shout out to Pete. Oh, I, I won't want to talk to him after this anymore. <laughs> but, but Jeff, thank you. And, and, uh, and Pete was talking about the fire service and the notion of 
hundred years of tradition not Im- not impeded by progress. You know, the the, the yeah. emergency services culture is very entrenched, but within firehouses and halls and stuff, you can change that climate. And so to move that over to the boardroom, you can change the climate, even if it's a culture of like in healthcare, it's it, there's a particular culture there, but you, you nailed it. That sphere of influence as a leader, you can control that temperature within yeah. your sphere of influence. And, and that's, you know, if nothing else, start there. I really, well, really like it's that. not that it's not just that you can, it's that you have to as a leader. That is your responsibility. Oh, man. Oh, Jeff. So just to wrap up, where can people find you in terms of some of your work <laughs> and, and the eventual, you know, hopefully they never come face to face with you because yeah. that's probably not a, an awesome episode in their life. But where can they reach out to you or maybe learn more? Yeah, you know, um, most of my work right now is within uh, public safety personnel, uh, emergency service. It's really where I'm dedicating a lot of my time. Um, we, um, I'm the clinical director of an organization, organization called the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation Canada, ICSF Canada, which trains peers to support first responders in their workplace. And then we have a provincial network, uh, the Alberta Critical Incident uh, Provincial Network, ACIPN. Um, and if you just Google those things, um, you'll find the work that I do, you'll find the contact. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, I, I don't have a high um, social media profile, websites, those sorts of things. People, people tend to find me and um, like-minded people. Um, I stay away from the people that don't like what I do, put too much energy into fighting with them, but I do actually work a lot with like-minded people. And you can always, uh, my, my email address um, is my first and last name no space or period between at shaw.ca. So Jeff Sitch at shaw.ca. And yeah, guess what? I answer my own phone. I respond to my own emails. Um, I respond to the people that uh, do this important work. I'll pick up my phone at three o'clock in the morning and people, uh, especially their first responders, can't believe that they're actually getting me on the phone and that I care enough to pick up the phone at three o'clock. And, you know, um, emergency services is 24-7, 365. How could I have psychologist hours if I'm there supporting them? So um, I pick up my phone and, and you know what most of them tell me is knowing that we can call you means that we don't have to call you um, because they, they know they can if they need to. Um, and as, as a leader, just being available has taught me so much that people respect that and they will work harder to not re- need to reach out. But when they do, boy, do they need you. But don't underestimate how being available to those around you that you lead um, really does really does impact the, the climate and the culture. And, and uh, I would be remiss, and I mean this sincerely, as a helper, thank you for helping the helpers. And uh, even when helpers don't think they need the help. So thank you. And it is making yeah. a difference. It literally is. Ten years ago, this conversation wouldn't even be had. Now it's a conversation that's starting, and and people are moving those yardsticks. And through the the efficacy of your work and many others that – that it's lending credibility and there's a trust that has been built up now. And so thank you for doing the work that you're, well, you're doing. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for having me and allowing me to speak to uh, what I'm passionate about. And um, uh, you know, again, I, I hope if anybody has any questions or anything like that, please do reach out. I'm happy to uh, work with like-minded people and um, support you in, in um, maybe changing your climate. I love it. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate your time. Pleasure.